We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. The text says, By faith Moses, when he was come of years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, uh, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. We have our text here before us, and it's talking about the faith of Moses. We have here in Hebrews chapter 12, a list of, I mean, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, a list of faithful people, uh, primarily from the Old Testament. And they are examples for us. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, they're used, these great examples of faith are used to encourage us to be faithful as well. And so when we think about Moses, when we, when we think about the appreciation that we should have for Moses' faith, we need to consider his circumstances, his background. He was born into slavery. He was a poor Hebrew. And he was adopted into royalty, and he became a, a rich Egyptian. And then he was raised by a faithful Hebrew nurse, which was actually his mother. And so uh, that's kind of his background as he gets started. To, now then, when we think about the, the, the way we can justify our appreciation for his faith, we can see how God blessed him because of his faith. Moses became the leader of his people. He became a liberator of his people. And then he became a lawgiver to his people. He appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 3. And so all of these things indicate the great faith of Moses. We see the humble backgrounds from which he began, the courage he had to break away from, from being in the household of Pharaoh, the hardship that he endured, and then how God blessed him time and time and time again. Now, again, Hebrews chapter 12, we need to imitate Hebrews chapter 12, we need to imitate the faith that we just read about in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith of Moses. And to demonstrate his faith and why we need to uh, imitate it, the first thing we need to look at is the fact that Moses looked beyond the present situation. You know, if he only looked at what was present right before him and he walked by sight and not by faith. In fact, the Bible teaches just the opposite. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. That's how Moses walked. He walked with an eye of faith. He didn't look at only those things that were right before him. He had to make a choice. The choice to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter or the choice to be a Hebrew and then suffer with his people. That was what was before him. Now, if he would have just looked at the, the present current situation, being Egyptian looked pretty good in comparison to suffering with his people. But yet he didn't look at what was right before him. He looked at the future. Not only the future in this life, but the future in the life to come. He had the long view of, of uh, life and eternity and not just what was right before him in the here and now. The faithless look at the present. And they see what's going on and what's most advantageous. In other words, if it makes you happy right now, if it's pleasurable, then that's what I'm going to do. And they just go for what's here and now. 
You know, that's the, what the beer drinker, that's what the beer drinker does. In fact, there's an old beer commercial that, 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 that was like, let's go for the gusto. Go for all the gusto you can have. And of course, their idea, they want to sell more beer because they think that what beer drinking is what brings the gusto. It's ironic and probably providential that that beer company is no longer in business. How about that? They went for the gusto and uh, it ran out. They wanted to live for the present. Didn't think about the long haul and they're out of business. You see, that's what happens when we look at just this present world and leave God out of the picture. James addresses this with those people that, that think in, in chapter 4, you know, there's some people that said, you know, we're going to go to another town and we're going to buy and sell, we're going to have gain. And, you know, that's all wonderful. They're planning for the future, but the problem is they left God out of the picture. James said they should be thinking, if the Lord wills, we're going to go and do thus and so. And he reminds us that our life is, is just a vapor. It's here but for a moment. But you know, even though our physical life is going to end, just a few years we're on this earth, our spirit, our soul is going to continue. And the body's going to be resurrected and reunited with the soul. And then we're going to stand in the judgment. See, we need to be thinking like, Moses, we don't need to just look at the here and now, but we need to plan for the eternal future. That's what we need to be looking at. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 32. Paul's talking about, he's making arguments for the resurrection. And one of the things he says, if after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, in other words, he, he's suffering for the cause of Christ, Right, and if you want to see suffering, just read Second Corinthians chapter eleven about the things that Paul suffered. Now think about that. If there's no resurrection, Paul did all that for nothing. He so so he says, if 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 after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantages does it give me? What's where's the advantage? If the dead raise not. If there's no resurrection, then there's no need to suffer in defense of the cause of Christ. And he says, this is what we should do if there's no resurrection. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. See, that's the way a lot of people look at the world. They look at the here and now, the present, and they don't think about what's going to happen in the next life. A lot of people don't think that way. They want gratification now. They don't want to wait for it. They don't want some pie in the sky by and by the way some people look at it. And we're talking about the atheist. We're talking about the agnostic. We're talking about the materialist, the modernist, those people that deny the existence of an afterlife. See, Moses wasn't like that. He made his decision. His determination wasn't based on the here and now. It was based on what was coming. He was basing it on what was coming. Now, the faithful look for an eternal advantage. That's the way Moses looked. He's looking for an eternal. What's going to have the best advantage in eternity? So, so here it is. Here's the choice. I can stay here, be the son of Pharaoh's daughter, have riches, power, prestige, all those things. Okay, now if I have that, what advantage is that going to get me in eternity? Nothing. There's no advantage in that. In fact, there's a disadvantage in that. So what's the alternative? Give all that up and go and suffer with his people. There's the choice. There's, there's, advan there's disadvantage in this life. Remember, if we're only thinking about this life, the advantage would be stay with the Egyptians. And, and there's disadvantages suffering with the people. 
If you only look at it from the advantage that this life offers. But he looked beyond this life. He looked to the eternal. And when he looked to the eternal, he understood that the advantage laid with his people, even though it meant suffering. That takes faith and courage and commitment. I'll tell you what, his mom must have done a great job bringing him up and teaching him about the Hebrew faith. For him to be able to, when he became of age, he made that decision. He had that much faith based on his mama's teaching that he turned his back on worldly privilege and traded it all in for suffering with his people. And he did that by faith, looking to eternity. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Paul tells Timothy, you know, about bodily exercise. He says, bodily exercise profits little. There's profit in it, right? It's not, he's not saying don't do it. It's not, it's not good. He's saying there's profit, but it's just a little profit. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and the life that is to come. <coughs> See, Moses understood that. Moses understood that. And so he was able to make that decision to leave the household of Pharaoh and go back and be with his people. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. The apostle Paul writing to the brethren at Rome. He says this, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What's that talking about? Well, this life we have suffering, we have conflict as a Christian, have hardship because of our faith. Not to mention all the other things that just come upon us as being humans in the world. We have the added difficulty of living the Christian life and the persecution that goes with that. Right? But Paul says, it's not to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. He's talking about the long view. He's talking about heaven. No matter what we have to suffer in this life, and this is what Moses understood, it doesn't matter what we have to suffer in this life, we're going to be glorified with God in heaven in the life to come. And what we suffer in this life is going to be insignificant in comparison. That's right. That's a hard choice to make. That's why it's done by faith. Moses was able to look beyond the present circumstance in his life and look to the eternal. And that's what we need to do if we want to imitate the faith of Moses. The second thing. Moses believed in unseen reality. You know, there's a lot of people that refuse to believe anything unless they can physically verify it through their senses. Okay? They have to physically verify it through their senses. They have to touch it, taste it, smell it, see it, hear it, whatever. Right? They have to verify it. That's the only evidence that they're going to accept. Moses wasn't like that. You know, there's some people that actually would say that there's no such thing as truth. Truth is just an illusion. Right? That you, you, you can't really trust anything, not even your own senses. Right? Right? Have you ever saw something and and really it was really something different than what you thought in the first place? You glanced at something, you thought it was something, you looked back and saw it's something else. So you can't even trust your eyes. Right? Yeah. You, you get on the witness stand and you're an eyewitness to an event and you let the defense attorney get after you. He knows all manner of ways to get you to doubt what you saw and heard and experienced with your own eyes and ears. Right? He's going to try to make you doubt 
that what you saw and heard is really true. There's people who go around and, and do that all the time. They doubt everything. And, and it seems like that the only thing that they believe we can know is that we can't really know anything. Do you see how absurd that is? My question is, are you sure about that? Are you sure that you can't know anything? See, that's, that's really ridiculous. It is messed up. But the fact is, people go through life like that all the time. Moses understood that things that are unseen are still real. Stood in this pulpit a few years ago. We did a, a, a lectureship on Christian evidences. We had a group of college kids come up here and, and we had an open forum and they was asking questions and they refused to believe in a God they couldn't see and verify empirically. And one of them happened to be a microbiologist. Now get this. He says, he says I study things you can't even see with a microscope. And I said, how do you know they're there? And then I, and he was kind of taken aback by my question. I said, so what, basically what you're see, saying is there's things there and you can see how other things around them react to that thing. And you know it's there even though you can't see it, right? Oh, yeah, that's it. That's the same way I believe in God. I can't see God, but I know he's there. Because he's the only explanation for things that I can see. Everything that's in existence that I can touch and I can taste and I can hear and I can see and I can smell. Oh, it's existence to God. That's the only reasonable explanation. You know, the Sadducees, it's really sad you see, right? That's how we always remember the Sadducees. They didn't believe in anything beyond this physical world. They didn't believe in the soul. They didn't believe in angels. I wonder how they even believed in God. And, and if they really believed in God, maybe they were kind of agnostic and they doubted God's existence. See, there are some people that wouldn't say God doesn't exist, but they would still doubt that God exists. Right? The Sadducees, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 23 said they didn't believe that there is a resurrection. There's a lot of people going around teaching that nonsense today. Teaching Max Kingism and 8070 doctrine and, and full plagiarism is what it's called and known by. Right? They're saying the resurrection's past. They overthrow the faith of some. The Bible warns about people like that. You know, it never ceases to amaze me that people will take things that the Bible warns about and that's the very thing that they're going to teach and promote. That there's going to be some people that deny the resurrection and overthrow the physical. That's what I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach what the Bible says is wrong and specifically spells it out. It's kind of like Roman Catholicism uh, denying people to marry and forbidding to eat meats. Yeah. Yeah, that's the doctrine I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach what the Bible predicts is going to be taught that's error that leads people into sin. But friends and brethren, Moses was able by faith to look beyond the physical world and know, not just hope God exists, but he knew God existed. <coughs> Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things unseen. We have evidence that God exists. That those things that we cannot see are true and they're real. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 it says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation, from the things that we can see, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. We can see the invisible things of God by looking at His creation. Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhood, so that they are without excuse. 
People that refuse to believe in God are without excuse because the evidence is there. I may not be able to see him, but I know without a doubt God is real, that he's there, that he's concerned with me, that he does things on my behalf, that he hears my prayers. See, Moses understood that. The universe and all that is in it testifies to the existence of God. Think about the, 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 just the Bible. The Bible demonstrates the existence of God. No other source for the existence of the Bible than God. He's the only source for the Bible. It, in fact, the Bible claims divine authorship over and over again. It demonstrates divine authorship. It does it through fulfilled prophecy. It does it through scientific foreknowledge. It does it through the unity of the Bible. On and on we could go. We've talked about those things before. It contains eyewitness testimony concerning Jesus. There was people that saw it firsthand. Just look at the first few lines of Luke. I've been an eyewitness from the very beginning and I'm going to write an accurate account of what I saw. And not only was he, re not, he wasn't just relying on his eyewitness account from memory, he was inspired in what he wrote. But it was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit from his perspective. It records the miraculous origin of Christianity. Started by miracles in the first century, now it continues by faith in the things that are written. But all of those things indicate and prove to us that there is a God and that we can put our faith and trust in Him and know that He's going to do the things that He says. So when we was talking about in Bible class this morning, I was talking about the value of the Old Testament. It demonstrates to us a lot of things about how God deals with mankind. Moses understood how God dealt with, with mankind. That's what, what allowed him to make the decision, the choices that he made, and that he was able to be useful in the service of God. There was no doubt in his mind about the existence of God. He didn't have to sit around and ponder it. He didn't have to go out on, on, uh, and take a leap of faith and hope God was there. No, he didn't do any of those things. He knew. He was confident that those things that were unseen were real, that they were, that they were fact and not fiction. The third thing about Moses. Moses feared God more than he feared men. Verse 27. When we think about Moses, think he had to go against Pharaoh. He turned against the king of Egypt. That's right. Think there's going to be consequences? There was so much consequences when he did that. And actually he killed a, a, an Egyptian that was abusing a Hebrew man. And, and it was so much consequences to his decision to do that. He left. He lived in Egypt 40 years. He left and lived as a shepherd for 40 years. I believe that part of his life was preparing him to lead the people. The first 40 years of his life was to prepare him to do what? To deal with Pharaoh. He was trained in all the ways of, of Egypt. Right? Then he lives out and he's a shepherd. Preparing himself to be a leader. You know, a lot of the, the leaders, the great leaders of God's people were shepherds. Look at David. Abraham. Yeah, they were shepherds. Yeah, lot, shepherds, great men, all great leaders. And so here he's preparing himself. Now he goes and 
and he spends the last 40 years of his life as a leader of God's people. But he, he had all that preparation and he made all those decisions, putting God first because he feared God more than he feared man. You know, he had some doubts about his ability to go back and lead God's people. You know, part of it was like, who am I? That the people are going to listen to me. God said, and you know, when it all came down to it, God basically said, you know, Moses, I'm going to be with you. Okay? Moses thought he was going to have to do it himself. No, Moses, you're not doing it yourself. I'm going to be with you. <coughs> right? But who am I? The people won't listen to me. He told him, to, here's some miracles you can do to confirm that you're uh, speaking on my behalf. Well, who am I to go speak to Pharaoh? I'm going to be with you. God's going to be with him. See? You know, when God's on our side, when God's on, on our side, how is it that we're afraid of what men can do to us? Why is that? To the Romans, Paul says we're more than conquerors because God is on our side. More than conquerors. We're not just going to win. We're going to more than win. Right? Because God's on our side. That's why I shouldn't be afraid to stand up to anybody. Because I have truth on my side. And as long as I have truth on my side, God is going to be standing with me. Fear of men... Is more pressing at the moment. If I don't make up my mind ahead of time. That I'm going to serve God. And I'm going to do what he wants. Every time. No matter what the consequences. If I wait until I get in the heat of the moment. To try to make that decision. What's going to happen? I'm going to turn tail and run. Before I ever get in that situation, that's why I try to teach young people a lot of time We're about moral decisions. There's a lot of moral decisions you've got to make. And the older you get, get up into to junior high and high school, you're going to be confronted with a series of choices. You need to make your choice now. You need to make your determination about what you're going to do with these certain moral issues right now. Whether you're going to take that first drink. Whether you smoke that cigarette, do drugs, fornication, modest apparel. You got to make those decisions now because if you wait until the heat of the moment, you're going to give in. You need to make your decision now what you're going to do. And then have the courage knowing that you've made the right decision. Truth is on your side. God is on your side. And then when it's time to tell your friends, no, I'm not going to do that, it's easier. That's right. But if you wait until you're in the middle of temptation to try to make those choices, it's not going to work out very good. You maybe can do it. I don't know. It might work out. But I can almost guarantee it will work out if you make those choices ahead of time. And so Moses had it in his mind because God encouraged him, I'm going to be with you, that when he got there, he'd already made his choice to stand up. Stand up to the people and stand up to Pharaoh. Let my people go. Can you imagine that? Here's, here's a man that's been a shepherd for 40 years. He's going to go to the king of the most powerful country and demand, let my people go. You think that took courage? Absolutely. Do you think he was afraid? He might have been afraid, but he was more afraid of God than he was of Pharaoh. That's right. He was more afraid of God than he was of Pharaoh. And that's what we need to be. We, we get in those situations where we have to make a moral judgment, a moral decision. 
yes or no, whether we're going to partake of some sin or not, we need to be more afraid of God than our friends. We need to be more afraid of God than our children. So, you know, some parents are afraid of their children. I never understood that. Some parents are afraid of their children. Children, you need to be more afraid of God than your parents sometimes. Because there's some ungodly parents out there. We need to be more afraid of God than we are the people we work with. That's right. We need to be more afraid of God than society that we live in. Because in all of these different situations, there are going to be a lot of ungodly people that are going to be trying to draw you away from God and cause you to compromise your faith and and turn away from your Savior. You need to be more afraid of God, the consequences of disobeying God, than the consequences of disappointing man. I need to be more afraid of God. And that's the way Moses was. That's how he had the courage to do the things that he did. Because he was afraid. (laughs) It's it's interesting that you can get courage from fear. Think about that. Because he was afraid of God. That gave him courage to face men. Courage from fear. That's right. Sounds kind of contradictory, doesn't it? But if I don't have the fear of God, I'll never have the courage to face man. That's right. I need to recognize that that displeasing God is far worse than displeasing man. That's where my fear needs to be. In fact, some people will commit sin, wrongdoing, Because they fear men more than they fear God. Have you ever thought about that? In Matthew chapter 14, verse 6 through 9, it says, But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath Stop it. Uh, He promised with an oath to give her whatsoever She would ask. You need to be careful what you promise, right? Open promise like that. And she, being before instructed of her mother, they had all this planned out, said, give me here John Baptist's head and a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat. He commanded it to be given her. He feared men more than God. And it caused him to kill an innocent man. You know why, you know why his, uh, her mother was mad at John the baptizer? Because she was living in adultery and he told her, it's not lawful for you to have that woman. It's not lawful for you to have her. So she conspired with her daughter. Now imagine that. Maybe you have to have courage to stand up sometimes to your parents. Here's here's Herodias getting her daughter to conspire to kill John the baptizer. And she commits an immoral act dancing in front of these men. So they lust after her and and want to do stuff for her. Now think, think about that. Sometimes children... Need to have courage to stand up to ungodly parents. Fear of God is more important in eternity. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are able to kill the, uh, not able to kill the soul, but rather feel, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, we need to fear that eternal punishment. That's the fear, part of the fear of God. 
You know, a lot of times we, we talk about godly fear as it's mentioned in Ecclesiastes 12 and, and verse 13. Uh, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You know, a lot of times we say, well, that's just, uh, that's just reverence for God. Godly fear is just reverence for God. But I'll tell you what, there's a place for fear and trembling when we think about what the fear of God. That's what we're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling we need to be afraid of the judgment of god upon the sinner especially if we're the sinner moses obeyed god by sheer faith verse 28 we think about some commands there is an obvious, okay, if I do this, if I obey this, then this is the result. I can see the connection, okay? And those commands are pretty easy to do. But sometimes God requires things of us and he doesn't make the connection all the time. And sometimes we just do things simply because God said to do it, right? Right? Because God said. Just give, me some, just give me some examples. Think about Noah in Genesis chapter 6 through 8. Right? Have the count of the flood. Noah's going to build the ark. You know, God says, Noah, I'm going to flood the world. And I'm going to destroy everything. You know, up until that point, it hadn't even rained. Never had it been a drop of rain on the earth. But now, God's telling Noah, it's going to flood and you need to build an ark. You talk about faith. He built the ark before it rained. It wasn't even raining when he built the ark, right? But because God said, this is what you need to do, Noah did it. Think about the death of the firstborn. Exodus 12 and verse 7. Okay, I want all you Hebrew people. I'm going to send the destroyer, right? Right? And he's going to come through here. He's going to kill all the firstborn. But I'm going to protect the Hebrew people. What I want you to do is kill this lamb. Gives us the criteria to choosing the lamb. And I want you to take the blood from that lamb. And I want to put it on the lentil and the doorpost. And I want you to be in the house. And you stay in the house all night. And you eat that lamb. You eat that bread. And dip it in the bitters. And do all those things. And when the destroyer comes, he'll pass over your house. Okay, there's a, an act of faith. Make any sense to you? I don't know. God said to do it, right? So we did it. That's how we get the Passover feast, to memorialize that event. Then what about in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 10, when Naaman, who is a leper, was told to dip five times in the Jordan River? Can anybody in their right mind figure out how dipping in, in a dirty river, and that was his complaint, our rivers are better than this. I've washed in those all the time. It didn't help my leprosy. See, he was looking at a worldly view right there, right? Wasn't looking beyond this world to what God was going to do. So we can't make the connection. But since God said to do it, if we want the benefit, then we have to do it. And we accept it by faith. Remember in, in the wilderness in Numbers 21 and verse 8. And the children of Israel rebelled. And God sent the serpents that bit them and they were dying. Right? The fiery serpents. And to cure them, he said, I want you to make a serpent of brass. And I want you to lift it up. And whoever looks at that is going to be healed. How does that work? How does that work? There's nothing medicinal about looking at a brazen serpent if you're dying of a snake bite. But the fact is, that's what God said to do it and everybody looked at it was healed. There's a matter of sheer faith, just taking God at his word and doing what he said, the way he said to do it without asking any questions. That's a matter of faith. John 9, the blind man, 
right? Made mud, put it in his eyes, go wash. He came back, you know, how does that make you see? But I don't know, I got mud in my eye one time and it made me see worse, right? But Jesus said, that's what you need to do. Without argument, without question, he went and did it and it says he came seeing. It's amazing. Just it just took him at his word and did it. You know, a lot of people have a tr have trouble with baptism. They can't make the connection between baptism and salvation. I don't have to understand why God chose baptism as the point at which I'm going to be saved. I don't have to know how that all works. I just need to know that God said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And by faith, I do it. I don't question. I don't argue. I don't have to ask for all the details. I just do it because that's what God said. In every one of these examples... We would all agree, well, you know, Noah did the right thing. Build that ark. We can see the results. Saved his, himself and his family and all those animals. Right? We can look back and we can look at the brazen serpent example and we say, those people did the right thing. They didn't understand it, but they did it and it worked out. They were healed. Well, it's the right thing. Washing the Jordan, Naaman, you know, he disagreed at first, but he came to his right mind. He went back and he did what was and came clean. Did the right thing, right? The blind man washed, washed that out of his eyes. He came, did the right thing, didn't understand it, but he did it. No medicinal value in that, but it cured his eyesight. But when it comes to, to, to baptism, people can't make the connection. They just don't have enough faith to trust in God to do what God said the way he said to do it for the reason he stated. And so they go away without the benefit because they don't have enough faith to trust in God. Moses is one of the great cloud of witnesses that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Carried over into chapter 12. That is to encourage us. To have the great obedient faith that he did. To be able to look beyond the present. And see the future and eternity. To be able to believe in the unseen reality of God. Even though. Never seen God. But he knew he was there. He trusted him none the same, none, nonetheless. He was able, because of his faith, to fear God rather than man and was obedient to God, even under extraordinary circumstances. And finally, he was able to obey God by sheer faith. He took God at his word and did the things that God required of him without fail. Isn't that wonderful? You know, we, we, we can be like that. We can have the same faith that Moses had if we'll just trust in God if we'll just do what he says accept him on his terms and not get bogged down in the cares of this world but think about this world as just a temporary home where only pilgrims passing through and really a home is laid up somewhere beyond the blue like our song says do you believe that? Do you want to go there someday? Then be like Moses. Have the faith to obey God. Believe in his son Jesus Christ. That he lived. That he died. That he was raised the third day. For remission of our sins. And that having faith in Jesus as the son of God. Literally God in the flesh. Do what he says. Repent of your sins. Confess his name before men. And be baptized for remission of sin. And as Christians, let's continue to live by faith in the fear of God. So that one day we'll stand in the judgment and hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard to live up to our convictions. And we fall away. And we go back into the world, back into sin. The Bible makes provisions for us to come back. 
to repent of that, to ask God to forgive us, and he will be just and he'll be righteous to forgive us of all iniquity if we'll simply turn from it and ask his forgiveness. So tonight, if you're subject to invitation, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing.